Essentially, the subject matter of a still life painting is anything that does not move or is dead. As defined, a still life may include all kinds of man-made or natural objects, cut flowers, fruit, vegetables, fish, game, wine, as well as whatsoever remains still. A still life can be a celebration of material pleasures or, at times, a warning of the impermanence of these pleasures and of the brevity of human life. From the first known findings of still life paintings that adorned the interior of Egyptian tombs to works that became one of the principal genres in Western art, Tim Cantor found himself captivated with those created in the Middle Ages to the Renaissance, but ever more particularly drawn to the Golden Age works of Dutch and Flemish artists. He studies solely the historic works of able painters, bringing much of his preferred technical observations under his own command. However, in spite of his love for classical art, his mind is present, his mind is impetuous, and has never known the boundaries that were pressed upon the talents of our past. By definition, a still life includes subjects that do not move or are no longer alive. And yet, Tim Cantor has placed his own exceptional point of view on this time-honoured tradition by impulsively placing living things as the central focal points within his mesmerising compositions. Though some liberally identify these Cantor works as still-life paintings, in truth, they resist the traditional definition as he presents thriving, breathing beings. Birds, a monkey, cats, dogs, mice. Indeed, anything that might pierce his thoughts, be it alive, be it breathing, or be it not. Regardless, each element is carefully chosen to heighten the feeling of what he is trying to convey through his influential arrangement, an arrangement of his own symbolic metaphors. In Secrets Never Told, he portrays a magpie watching over an assemblage of possessions. The European magpie is one of the few animal species known to be able to recognize itself in a mirror. They are notorious for gathering bits and shiny pieces and therefore this painted magpie is also a reference to a person obsessed with collecting things has a mind full of curiosity and ultimately cares. A prying mind might find slight details such as the ages of the artist and his wife when they met and a number that Tim Cantor dreamed prophesizing the age he will live to be. Likewise in Beautiful Monster objects of affections and interest are surrounded by things that are both rare and precious, remind us of how fleeting life is. In this piece, Tim Cantor particularly draws attention to the dramatic. Not only is this monkey alive and well, he aggressively shrieks to seize the moment, breaking the imaginary boundary and inviting us momentarily into his world. In respect to the painting Delft Blue, Cantor connects his love for Dutch art, particularly the 17th century painting of Franz van Mieris and Johannes Vermeer. Many of these paintings, though customarily considered genre scenes, have elements that undoubtedly deem as still life compositions. With this added influence, Tim Cantor compelled an even deeper connection to these artists by wittingly applying a distinctive paint that he acquired in Amsterdam, near to Delft, the historical home of Vermeer. Since this scarce blue paint is originated in powdered form, Tim crushes and mills the powder with linseed oil as did the fervent Dutch artists of centuries ago, 
and moulds it into the cobalt lush hues that live within his final painting. The painting itself centres around a Delft vase. This blue and white glazed porcelain reached prime productivity in the 17th and 18th centuries and became an undeniable symbol of the Netherlands. These, as well, were the breathing years that Vermeer and Mieris lived and painted in Holland. Thus appears another veiled meaning, a personal attachment to two Dutch ghosts that compellingly live within Cantor's admiration, wistfully rendered into his vase as reverence. The blue jay that stands atop the Delft vase, with a virtuous ring balanced above, opposes the dark connotations that culture has attached to this bird's innocent existence. Its existence sits between the subjects of now and of then. One could say that Delft Blue's prevailing core is that it is a painting stirred by the stretch of age. It exists because of the past. It shifts possibility to the lives of the present and brings wonderment to what we might incite to the unborn lives that lay ahead. In the same period as Delft Blue, Cantor painted a still life titled My Beloved. The imagery as a whole relates to the adoration and affections the artist holds for his wife, Amy. From the pomegranates she implored him to paint for years, to the ten flowers she carried on their wedding. The detailed elements all lead back to this love and to the strengths and weaknesses they share together resolve together and become stronger as one. Courage, fragility. He protects her, she protects him. A further attribute to Amy within this painting is found etched on the spine of three books, the selfless ballerina, Il Lago del Signi and En Poix. Titles of three previous paintings all of which directly relate to Amy and paintings that she personally posed for. As with all of his work, Tim Cantor finds a way, even within these random objects and impulsive creatures, to make us feel his sentiments. He has taken the placidity of an historical genre, the still life, and spoken his voice through their silent bits and pieces. The rich colour, the depth, the precision are merely the lure that holds a far deeper story. A thread that connects to the unknown and begs to be deciphered over the spell of time. In their beauty lay a mystery, buried like clues. They hide aspects throughout their vivid setting and will forever hold the artist's mortal life within their immortal continuance. <laughs>